from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hey, uh, everybody, and welcome to the Wow Report, where every week we count down the top 10 things that made us go wow this past week. And uh, I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder, joined by James St. James, editor-in-chief of the Wow Report. Uh, and the, that's right. And the host of the new upcoming soon to be launched podcast, Night Fever. And this week we have a very special guest in for Tom Campbell, Seth Abramovich. Hey. Uh, so senior writer for the Hollywood Reporter. I would just get in your credentials. Not that you need credentials to be on this show. So <laughs> <laughs> and uh sitting in your lap is Otto, is that right? That's right, Otto. He's a uh, journalist in training. <laughs> Lord. Lord. All right, so let's start the countdown. We start at number 10. Number 10. Number 10, I wanted to talk to Seth a little bit about an article that he just did for The Hollywood Reporter uh, that's getting a lot of buzz about the great Brett Butler and sort of the hard time she's fallen on. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about how you how you just came to the article and what you learned about her. Uh, well, I just saw on Twitter that there was a GoFundMe to raise uh, money for her to pay rent. And um, that sort of shocked me. I hadn't thought about her in many years, but uh, I remember really admiring her. She was part of that Roseanne era, you know, the mid 90s. And uh, she had her own sitcom, Grace Under Fire. And uh, I always thought she was really cool and funny and Southern and took no crap. And I was surprised to hear uh, that she was in that state. And so I Actually, I thought, well, I'd like to interview her, and I didn't know how to reach her, and I tweeted at her, because she is on Twitter. And uh, that led to a few discussions, and she was embarrassed, really, about her financial state, um, and and insisted there was no story there. And, uh, you know, I didn't pressure her, but I said, you know, I think it could be good for you if we, if we did this story, and you just brought people up to date with what's going on. And... Um, and so then we did it, and she's amazing. I love her. Uh, she's so smart. I mean, it's sad what's happened. She, you know, first of all, she, she had a very public Vicodin addiction that led to the end of the show back in the '90s. She was very volatile those last couple of seasons, and and yes. the show sort of tanked because she was a little crazy, right? Yes, and um, she got clean, um, and then she moved to Georgia and she bought a farm. Um, and she was making a lot of money, $250,000 an episode at the at the peak, and it went for five seasons. Um, and um, she lost all of it and lost the farm literally um, and moved back here 10 years ago to L.A. To, to She thought, well, maybe I can just, you know, be an actor again. And she does really enjoy acting, and she's very good at acting. Well, yeah. she's on um, The Walking Dead now, isn't she? I mean, isn't that sort of helping to pay the bills, or no? Well, her her head's on a pike, so she's not coming back to that show. Nobody lasts very long on that show. <laughs> huh. um, but, you know, she's not making the kind of money she used to make. It never went into syndication. I, it, you never see it playing anywhere. I, and I wonder if Hollywood turned her its back on her. Yeah. And uh, she was she was relying on DVD money that never materialized. And, uh, you know, it's an extreme example because she, she made many millions of dollars. But as she put it, that she felt she didn't deserve the money. And that's a different thing. She, she has issues, you know. Um, so she gave it all away or she just invested it? She gave it away. She didn't want to get into specifics, but I, I know that uh, an ex-husband got a lot of it and um, she, she was stolen from and she and she just didn't pay attention to it. You know, she, right. she didn't have that money manager that was, that was keeping an eye on her. So it's sad, but it I, I never doubted in talking to her that there's another chapter for her, you know, and that she's she has all her faculties. She's smart as anything. And very funny and um and that's what i just kept saying to her i was like look we can we can make another chapter and something else can happen and and i think i don't want to say that i did this for her but there was definitely a turn in in her mood uh since uh, definitely since the story came out and she's been contacting me and saying that the 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 response has been amazing and uh just on the gofundme it went from like thirteen thousand to forty thousand. wow 
And, um, you know, I'm hoping some work comes out of it for her and, and that she writes a, a new uh, stand up routine because that's how she started. And I think she described it as her, her the purest uh, form for her, you know, where no one else is telling her what to do. It's just her, a microphone and a crowd. So my dream is to see her on an hour long like Netflix special where she kind of talks about what happened that in a funny nice. way. Yeah, yeah she she's I, always had a, a, like that Roseanne lacerating wit, you know, but yeah, she, she seems to be a little more turned inward than Roseanne ever was. Sort Definitely. Of. Yeah, really she's, she's, she's got sort of a, a, a wound that, that needs healing, I always feel. But I love that you are suddenly the, the protector of these iconic women in Hollywood that have maybe fallen on hard times that like you're sort of. You, you are the guardian angel that comes in and is helping these women who, these people who just, you know, deserve more. You yeah, it's not women. like, it sounds lofty, but I'm, I'm not trying to be anyone's guardian angel. I, I'm attracted to certain kinds of people and certain kinds of stories. And it just so happens that, you know, I had done Shelley Duval and now this one. And if that's going to be my reputation, let that be my reputation. Because I, I love these women, you know? Right. So. It shows. It shows. Who's next? Oh, for my profile? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't reveal, but I have a few. I have a few in, in, in coming down the pike. I that tell I you, that there must be quite a few out there. Actually, it's a rich seam that you're mining. <laughs> well, Hollywood can be rough, you know. Right? Yeah. I mean, I always find it um, dissonant or sort of hard to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars an episode to imagine someone with literally nothing where they need to do a GoFundMe. I'm not doubting the sincerity of it, but it's always shocking to, 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 to go from that height to, you know, from the, from the top to the bottom in that way financially. It's so shocking, isn't it? It's extreme. And I only hope it doesn't happen to Otto. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. We're going to post a link to your article set on the web. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. And let's go on to number nine. Number nine. Number nine, I watched Memories of a Murderer, the Dennis Nielsen tapes on uh, Netflix. Have you heard about this? Hard to keep up. What? It's hard I to keep up all the murders, you know? Blake, what? I haven't heard about it, but I'm excited to hear about it because I love these murder shows. Well, this <laughs> one is really extraordinary. Dennis Nielsen was one of the most prolific serial killers in UK prolific. history. What? Well, no, okay. Well, let me start over again. Hold on, before you make fun of me, he was one of the 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 the, the biggest serial killers in UK history. And um, do you remember him at all, Fenton? Well, I, the name did he put people in acid? I'm trying to remember what he did. Yes, what did he, he was he was a gay man, and he would scour the West End of London in the 1980s, and he would find other transient gays, and he would promise them food and shelter and sex and whatever. And when he got them home, he would uh, chop them up into little pieces and and then put them in acid and then shove the pieces down the storm train in the garden. Yes, Blake? I've talked, I've talked about um, my favorite book called Exquisite Corpse on this show, Poppy Z. Bright, and one of the characters is based on this guy. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, this, he um, wanted to write his memoirs while in prison. And so he got a cassette tape and he starts talking about the murders and he's, he's detailing them in extreme. He's very intelligent. He's very, uh, he's all his faculties are there and he's telling the stories of these murders and of his childhood and his trauma and blah, blah, blah. And then he sent it to a reporter at the telegraph, I think is what it was. And then he died. And so the reporter just had all these tapes and has released these tapes and he has this sort of Scottish brogue and this sort of deep voice. And he's talking about the murders and his horrible mother with her yellow teeth and that bitch of a, you know, blah, blah. And he sort of sounds a little bit like Boris Karloff narrating when the Grinch stole Christmas. And everything <laughs> is very, he's very smug and very happy with himself. And it's all, it's, it, and you get chills listening to it. It is so horrible. Um, to to hear him talk about, you know, shoving the bodies down the, the storm train and everything. But one of the worst parts of it is there was this guy who escaped from him and he went to the police. But 
because he was gay, the police called him, they, they gathered around and made fun of him and called him a poofter and said, the Nancy boy is making all this up. Go home. You were dreaming, blah, blah, blah. And he's saying, you know, this guy tried to kill. He was going to chop me. It was blah, blah, blah. And I managed to escape out the window and he threw himself out the window and he just, you know, comes in covered in blood and they still send him home. And it all could have been ended. And sadly, he said that it was that there were 16 victims, but we, there might be more, but they've only managed to identify four of four or five of them. I think he died of natural causes in prison or was he murdered in prison? I think he died of natural causes. Mm -hmm. It wow. sounds similar to um, what's the American version of that Jeffrey guy? Dahmer. Uh, who? Dahmer. Dahmer. Yeah. And then th that someone escaped and the police yes. didn't take them seriously. I always had nightmares about that Dahmer case where the, the young uh, Asian kid just is running naked down the street and the police return him to Dahmer. Yeah. I actually gave him back to Dahmer. That's, yeah. that's shocking. Right. Oh. I mean, it was James, your guy in this story, he got to go home, right? He didn't die. He was. Yeah, no, he, he went home and he's, I think they interview, oh, they interview him and he sort of relives the trauma of, of leaping through the window, the plate glass window. What did they do to visualize the tapes? Because is it just archive and interviews or? It, it's Yeah, it's a lot of archive. And, you know, you have a lot of tracking shots of the West End in 1984 and homeless people sleeping on the street. And then you're talking about it, blah, blah, blah. I watched I the Ripper one. one. Wait, what? The Ripper? That was scary. That was women that he was yeah. tracking. But no, no. You mean the Jack the Ripper Ripper one? No, it was like in the 70s, but in England as well. No, I don't know that one. Prostitutes. Oh, it's good. It's on Netflix. Okay. Okay. The guy who did, uh, oh God, what was he called? Rillington Place. He lived in Rillington Place. What was his name? Christy. Um, there, there's, yeah, there's a lot of serial killers in the UK. It's not a good, it's not a good place. Well, and I, I gloomy and everyone's like, you know, bored on the moors and the, the mist rolls in and what are you going to do? Uh, a little bit of murder. <laughs> all right, well, let's go on to number eight. Number eight. June, June, October twenty second. Oh, have you seen it? October twenty second, June twenty twenty one, by Denise Villeneuve is being released. It hasn't even played at the uh, Venice Film Festival. That's coming up. And yes, I've seen it, James. But I'm not, it's embargoed. I'm not allowed to say. I'm not allowed to say a word about it. Well, then but I, I will. Hold on. No, I have a few questions. I will next okay. week. No, no, hold on one second. Hold on. First of all, um, uh, uh, Timothy Chalamet, his cheekbones and jawline are incredible from what I've seen. It, does he, is he a good, it, does he pull it off? I can't say. I can't say what. <laughs> what I can do is tell you about Dune, the original book. Did you read the original book? Well, yeah, of course. You're well, good. okay, but hang on. This is a, we're having, culturally, we're having a Dune moment because, you know, the book was published in, what, 1965? Mm -hmm. And it's a great story because, as you probably know, on Arrakis, which is a completely bone-dry planet, they have this thing called spice. And spice enables you to fold time and space so you it's can- It's a K-hole is what it is. Uh, exactly. <laughs> it's very 60s. It's mm -hmm. like LSD without taking LSD. And the other thing is you've got this planet without any water, which is kind of referencing the oil crisis and our dependence on fossil fuels, you know? And it's this very long book, right? Paul Herbert, I think I'm right saying, wrote it. So you've, you've read it, James. Well, it was in college. It was sort of like, you know, it was one of those things that everyone, you know, that and the Seth, Cimmerillion or whatever. It? Seth, did you read it? I have a copy of it and I keep starting it and putting it down. It's it's very dense at the beginning. Like, yeah, it's, yeah you, you, sort of have on, you have to be on LSD to read it, basically. So for yeah. years and years and years, they tried to, this is supposed to be the best-selling sci-fi book of all time, apparently. And for years and years and years, they tried to make a movie of it. Well, they Jodorowsky. did the with Sting, remember? Well, they did, that's right. David Lynch made a movie in 1984, which was lampooned as just awful. And I watched a bit of it, yeah, I thought, I'm gonna watch Dune from 1984. About half an hour in, you lose the will to live. Um, what's his face? Who's the guy from Showgirls who plays- um, Oh, who Kyle plays McLaughlin. Thank you, yes, he plays uh, that. You have Sting with orange hair in the little Speedo. You do. You have Sting levitating around and, and yeah. sucking the life force out of beautiful twinks. Um, what, I mean, you know, what is the deal with that? With the heart plugs and the twinks and the what? That's so I remember that as a kid. 
it's very Dennis Nielsen, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, but I am excited to see this. And, and then there was the aborted version of Jodorowsky who tried to make Dune and right. he got that unmade movie is kind of almost the earth source of, of Blade Runner, of Star Wars, of so many sci-fi tropes. And, well, uh, also, I mean, I don't think that um, the Lord of the Rings would have been as popular in the 60s exactly. had it not been for uh, exactly. Dune. Yeah. Uh, and there's a great documentary called Jodorowsky's Dune, which I really do recommend. It's so good and so interesting. Well, because, because I'm excited. First of all, the outfits look really fantastic for, for this new one. And I love Oscar Isaacson. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. And um, Zendaya, who I think is poised to become the next... Greta Garbo. <laughs> yeah, she's 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 gonna she's going places. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited to hear what you have to say next week. Will you? Can you, when we shut off the cameras, will you tell us something? Okay, I will. If if uh, yes, if you, if you stick around at the end, I'll do a little bit of Dune for you. Okay, but I I really they're quite serious about their embargoes. But uh, yeah, um, let's take a break. Shall we take a break? Um, this week, Seth, this is for you especially, James Apalooza, which is a full week celebrating legendary club kid and author James St. James. Um, <laughs> we've done a whole special section on Where It Presents Plus that is all his work. It's like transformations. What else have we got there, James? You're so you, modest you, to die and retiring. <laughs> you, you got some. You got some uh, wig stock appearances. Yeah. You, you got. Uh, you got. You got a little. A little bit of everything there. Plus, of course, your podcast Night Fever is launching next week as well. And first, first episode wait, with Diane Brill, Queen of the Night. But wait, there's more. Uh -huh. Party Monster, the book, James, your book is being re-released. It is, and we just saw the cover today, and I was very pleasantly surprised. It's really fantastic. I can't wait to share it on Instagram. So that is James Apalooza coming to Wow Presents Plus and Night Fever, wherever you get your podcast. <laughs> and it's laundry day, so I'm wearing my Party Monster t-shirt. <laughs> he was wearing it yesterday, too. God, I haven't done <laughs> laundry yet. <laughs> um, okay, since we're talking movies with Dune... Um, what year was the last time a major Hollywood movie re was released on VHS? And bonus points if you know the movie. Ooh, we'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back to The Wow Report. I'm Fenton Bailey here with James St. James and our very special guest standing in for Tom Campbell, Seth Abramovich, senior writer at The Hollywood Reporter. It's so good to see you again. Great to see you too. Um, I asked what year was the last time a major Hollywood movie was released on VHS? Bonus points if you know the movie. Seth, I'm giving this to you first. I'm going to say... 2009. And what would what movie would you think that would be? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I was going um, to say it was like around that time, like maybe 2007. It might have been like one of the Star Wars or something, a Star Wars well, thing. Yeah. Fenton, you have a guess? Jurassic Park, I don't know. It was 2006. Okay. And it was a it was Cronenberg's A History of Violence starring Viggo Mortensen. Wow, that's sort of a weird way to but go out. Appropriate, appropriate because of course Cronenberg made one of my all time favorite movies of all time, Videodrome in 1982, <laughs> which is all about the sort of transformative power of video. And I think someone uh, James Woods ends up with a. A vagina in his stomach that you put video <laughs> into, and Debbie so, Harry yeah. gets her head blown off, right? Wow, anyway, yeah. no, something happens. Uh, is that but, scanners? Oh, scanners, right? <laughs> so, see, I've never been able to watch either of those movies. <laughs> oh Seminal movie, video drum. All right, let's go on with our countdown. Number seven. Number seven. Candyman, the remake. Um, it uh, well, let's talk about the original. Have you seen the original? Yes, many times. 
the original had a real uh, subliminal pull. Like there's something uh, very, there's a reason why it stuck with us. It, 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 had, it had something to it that I unfortunately felt was missing in the new one. They leaned into the politics of it uh, in the new one. Um, so there was a lot of sort of didactic explaining, explaining of, you know, why things are happening. And it kind of pulled away from the like dreamlike horror of the original. Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. Yeah. They definitely do a lot of saying of the Candyman in the mirror. So you you get the basics. You get the bees. You get the hooks. You get the the five times in the mirror. Um, but I was a little let down. I have to say, what's her name from Sideways? Um, she's amazing. Uh, oh, okay. She's Andrew? no the the blonde one. You know, oh, Virginia, um, Virginia Madsen. Virginia Madsen. Yeah, yeah. she she gets. Uh, she was in the original. Yeah, she was in the original, and and uh, she keeps getting framed by the Candyman, and she's you know they keep putting her in in more and more like secure restraints because they think she's this insane killer, and um, uh -huh. and there's definitely like a Phantom of the Opera kind of relationship between the Candyman, who's played by Tony Todd, who's like almost seven feet tall and very magnetic and sexy. They had this sort of like Phantom of the Opera type relationship where he would visit her and he'd be like you're going to kill for me and you'll do this. And it was very um, sexy, I guess. And this one kind of uh, is not as focused. Well, but I keep seeing on Twitter that there's a lot of hate being directed towards it. The people who wanted to go, who went into it wanting to love it are really not responding to it. I, I, I guess I'm one of those people, mm -hmm. but I, the reviews have been very good, but um, generally, but um I was, I, I, but I don't want to like, you know, poo poo on a, a movie that people are excited about. So let's just say, go check it out and decide for yourself. Well, it wasn't it on the, the shelf for, a, wasn't it supposed to be released yes. like in 2020 and then because of the pandemic. And so it's, it, I think people had unreasonable expectations because they'd probably been waiting for a year and a half or 30 years. Yes. And it's very current. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm wondering if uh, people, like all the victims are white. <laughs> um, which I don't know if that's going to cause any controversy. It, it, I, I don't want to give anything away, but like all the victims end up being white. What's huh. the political aspect to it? That new well, you know, it's, it takes place in Cabini Green in Chicago. And, uh, you know, the, the, the original Candyman was the victim of a, of a lynch mob. Um, in this one, they expand that idea to, to, to be uh, uh, anti-black violence uh, over the centuries, you know, and that's very worthy and cool, but um, it needs to, to bring the horror, you know, and uh, I felt it was just a little scattered. And then the last act kind of goes by really quickly and you're like, what's, what's going on? Mm. Well, okay. that, that's the Candyman um, and you can go see it in theaters. It, it's opening today, first day. And I recommend um, rewatching the original, which is for free on Peacock first, because there there are uh, through lines from that one to this one. Okay. All right. Let me is get. It a re I'm sorry. Is it a remake or is it a whole new story? It's a whole new story. It's thirty oh. years later. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah, it's a it's a sequel. It's it's okay. a sequel. So it you can watch them. I don't know about the number two and number three because they did make. Three original. Yeah. Uh, you can go from the original Candyman to this one and it connects. Awesome. Great. Uh, number six, James. Number six. Number six. I watched The Chair, the, um, the new series on Netflix starring Sandra O oh and Holland Taylor and Bob Balaban and uh, Jay Duplass. For Jay Duplass from the Duplass brothers. They're like, oh. they do independent films. Well, he's so handsome. I'm going to talk about him in a second. And this is um, Sandra is the first woman of color to be named um, head chair at Pembroke College to the Department of Literature. And what she finds is that the the every all the professors there have all been tenured a hundred years ago, and they're all sort of these decrepit old men who are stuck in their ways. And she's trying to shake things up, and everybody sort of closes ranks around her throughout this series and um it's just sort of a series of misfortunes and she has a daughter this little girl who steals every scene and she's in love with uh this other professor who accidentally well he's giving a, a lecture and he does like a heil hitler is a joke and it becomes a meme and suddenly they the um everybody in the school starts 
protesting against him and it sort of snowballs out of it. But the reason to watch it is Holland Taylor gives a performance that is just it's it's so heartbreaking and volcanic and hysterical and powerful she's this older woman in who has been with it forever and ever and ever and she's never gotten anywhere in the in the college and the men have always she's always been a victim of like sort of male control and everything but you know this year we've had jennifer coolidge in white lotus We've had, you know, um, uh, Gene Smart in Hacks and, and Mayor. And this is up there with that. It's, it's, it's as good as those. We've been blessed with these amazing women this year. And this might be Holland's best work ever. And it might be, I imagine that next year's Emmy will pit her against Jennifer. I have a feeling that it's going to come down to that because they are both, they're such different performances, but you just, you end up just, loving her so much and just sobbing for her and like i said this jd plus character he needs to be a a, a, a leading man because by god he is he plays this sort of rumpled professor who's sort of like you know all over the place but just magnetic and just daddy as fuck my god he's just just something else hmm. this is on who you know, it's on Netflix. Oh, Netflix. Okay. And a lot of people have, it's, it's been getting mixed reviews. Um, some people are saying that it's too slow and it's, you know, it's sort of like, it, cause it's about academia and it's sort of, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I definitely was there. I, I did it all in once and they're half hour episodes. So they're very easy wow. to love a half do. hour episode. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's the chair streaming on Netflix. Um, did you guys watch, uh, this is number five. Number five. Did you guys watch um, The Morning Show? Oh, the Jennifer Aniston? Yeah, I never watched it till Ooh, this I never week. Have either. Oh my gosh. It, Seth, did you like it? Yeah, I, I had, it wasn't perfect, but it was definitely, uh, you know, a lot of great performances. And you know what? Brett Butler played Reese Witherspoon's mother on it. Oh, right. No. Oh, got it. Totally. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Um, I've only two episodes into the first series. The reason I want to talk about it today is season two is coming uh, September 17th. Um, and the first two episodes, oh, my God, they're so good. Jennifer Aniston, who I've always kind of liked, actually, is really good playing a Katie Couric type news anchor, you know, pretty, mm -hmm. you know, pretty and sweet, but not really so sweet. And Reese Witherspoon was, un I didn't realize it was her, is playing a sort of unhinged activist, young, sort of all about Eve type scenario, right? She's the, the young newcomer come to force out Jennifer Aniston. And I suppose the sort of the trigger of this, of the series, the series is based on the book Top of the Morning, um, which was about the battle between the Today Show and Good Morning America, because, you know, the Today Show was number one for something like 852 weeks. And finally, Good Morning America took over. But the trigger event in this series is, of course, uh, Matt Lauer's firing for uh, sexually inappropriate conduct and things of that nature. And it's just really good. It's really, and Billy Crudup plays a sleazy network executive, and he's so good at it. I, I mean, like him. I think he's fantastic. He was in, wasn't he in that Jackie movie a couple of years ago? And he really sort of blew me away. The Jackie he always Jackie plays Kennedy. villains. He's really good at playing villains. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm excited to see season two. And I'd never watched it. I guess you know Apple Plus of all of the mega streamers. So Apple Plus seems to be the place you never really bother going to or watching. But. Um, Maybe this is their show, you know, the breakout show. No, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I um, uh, I don't know why I avoided it, but I, I did. Maybe I, I don't think I go to Apple Plus that much. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I'll I, definitely I, watch the second season. Yeah. Right. They've got the Mandalorian. Right. That's the other thing. That no, that's have. Disney. That's yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course they don't have that. <laughs> Blake, <laughs> cut that out. <laughs> 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 no, they have Ted Lasso. Even oh. I knew that. Yeah, I don't even think I have Apple Plus. I don't have an Apple. I have Roku. So can I get Apple Plus? 
Yeah, you have to pay for it, but well, yeah. I see that's just it. I, you know, but dear God in heaven, I, I need a raise to keep up with this damn show because I cannot keep streaming all, get all these different streaming things. I'm, I'm paying like four hundred dollars in cable bills a month. All right, moving on. Uh, we'll, do- <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we'll tell. We'll ask Andy to pay for it. Yes, <laughs> Radio Andy, pay for it. Good luck with that. Drag Race uh, Philippines, James, will be on Wow Presents Plus. So that's another streaming service for you to subscribe to. But hey, it's only four ninety nine, less than the price of a latte, right? <laughs> I actually have Wow oh. Presents Plus. That is the one that I do have now. Well, that's good because you're going to be. It's all about you next week. It's w- James a Palooza. Well, you you say James a Palooza, and I I will put give my four dollars and ninety nine. <laughs> Blake, what do you have a question for us? Um, yes, I do. It's a birthday question. He's a director and a fashion designer from Texas. Today is his birthday, and we hope it's fucking fabulous. Who is he? Oh well, oh. well. We'll have the answer if you haven't guessed it already. Right after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. <laughs> and welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Jane St. James and our very special guest, senior writer for the Hollywood Reporter, Seth Abramovich. Blake, I think you asked us the easiest birthday question in the annals of questions on the Wow Report. What'd you call me? <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a birthday question. He's a director and a fashion designer from Texas. Today's his birthday, and we all hope it's fucking fabulous. Who is it? Can I Tom guess? Ford. Yeah, go. Tom Ford. Tom Yay. Ford. Yay. Happy birthday, Tom Ford. Woo. I have- all right. So happy birthday, Tom Ford. Let's carry on with the countdown. Top 10 things that made us go, wow, we've reached number four. Number four. Okay, number four, I mean, everyone's talking about it. We might as well. Jeopardy. What a crap show. <laughs> okay, um, so I, there was, have been some developments since we last talked about it. Last where, week we talked about yeah, it. Yeah, where oh, wow. Richard, what is, what is his name, the, the producer? Michael Richards. Michael Richards. He has stepped down and take it from there. What else has been going on? I, I just can't believe how they screwed this up. I, it's unbelievable to me. I mean, it doesn't seem like that complicated a task, uh, you know? And they've just done everything they can to screw it up, and it makes me wonder who's running it. Well, it's this awful person, Michael Richards, who is right. the hubris, the absolute, just like, how dare you think that you can just make that pivot from producer to host? Like, what goes on in your head? And you think that nobody's going to be mad about it. Well, well next week, this, this show is going to be the Blake Jacobs show, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it well, definitely I would improve. like to point out that we're on a, a, a radio station called... Uh, Radio Andy, and he was a producer at Bravo until he became online talent. I mean, right. on air talent. So it's not like it's never happened before. Um, right. But this was a weird uh, bake off on, uh, you know, in front of the world. And, um, it Where just, you were led to believe that you were actually there was actually all these people in running to become the the host when in actuality it had already been you know decided amongst the powers that be that he was going to do it. So the whole thing was just a fraud from the beginning. And what I'm hearing is that there's there's you know dissension in the ranks and that the the writers the people who actually make the the, the trivia questions on the show are not okay with that decision. And so you have this interesting thing between really the, the, the creative powers behind Jeopardy and these uh, suits. Um, but they they kind of spoil Jeopardy, right? Because it, it was... Well, yeah, I mean, nobody wants to go back to it now because it every... And, and the fact that Mayim Bialik, who, you know, bless her heart, she's great on, you know, Big Bang Theory, but she's got some weird ideas about science and vaccinations. And, and it sort of seems like a weird fit to have this weird anti-science person doing a show about you know she also said something that if you have to have a c-section then maybe the baby shouldn't survive or something or got some she's in how she didn't she like she believes in breastfeeding till they're 10 or i mean like she just has all these bizarro notions 
She's a temporary host, right? So who do you think no, will no, be? No, no, no. They've now oh. said that she's stepping in as the permanent host. She was just oh. going to do night times. And I think today it was announced that she's doing the specials. She's doing like the primetime specials. No, 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 no. Now, today, I think I read that she is doing the, the nightly for until they find someone else. Until well, they who find would you, someone else. Who would you have? Well, I liked Ken Jennings. I thought I watched his shows and I thought... He was very amicable and, and comfortable in front of the camera. And it impresses me that he probably knows the answers to like 90% of these questions. I don't know that to me, that's impressive. I, no. I like Ken Jennings on Twitter. I don't know that he's got the, 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 the judge, the, the it factor for TV. Well, I, I, he has his own game show, The Chase on ABC. Okay. I and I actually like it. I was hoping for LeVar Burton because he's so beloved and he's, he's, you know, he's so iconic in the educational field for his PBS, you know, the, what was the learning show, the reading rainbow. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, he just seems like somebody that the generations have grown up with. I just think he has that same sort of Alex Trebek vibe about him, but he didn't get a good shot at it really. Couldn't this whole thing be about getting publicity and attention for Jeopardy, though? Doesn't it like well, but it, it backfired on them. I think that's what they thought they were doing, but then it completely it. But did it? I mean, the same thing with this. Uh, the, the 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 OnlyFans. I mean, everyone is up in arms over the OnlyFans. Now everyone's talking about OnlyFans, and everything's back to how it was. So well, I wonder if maybe these things are good for them in the long run. Well, you. It's that you know, any publicity is good publicity. But with OnlyFans, it's sort of the same thing. Where I don't know that they're you know they lost something like eighty nine percent of their business in that one day when they announced it, and I don't know that those people or that eighty nine percent mm -hmm. is ever going to come back. Well, you have to go will. back and re-sign up to those accounts, don't you? Not that I would know, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have them tabbed? <laughs> I didn't know they'd reverse that policy, James, have they? They did, so and, but, but the people who, you know, the, the people... And OnlyFans, I mean, it's a, it's a whole other subject, but that's something that a lot of people made it through the pandemic doing you know only fans and it's just it it just felt icky and wrong to take that away and i i don't like the people who came up with that idea i'm just anti only fans now oh. not oh, anti-sex sure. work but you know but it was the credit card companies right yeah well was it though <laughs> were, were, were they were they just were, were they threatened with it and but because now they seem to be fine with the credit card company i mean i don't know i feel like there's more to the story oh well watch the space then um, let's move on in the meantime to number three. Number three. Um, number three, I went to the Getty Museum last week, the the villa, the one in the Palisades, because there was a really mar there are two marvelous exhibits, one on Mesopotamian cuneiform that was just uh, cuneiform, cuneiform. Cuneiform, and, yeah. Cuneiform. And then uh and it was just spectacular. And the other was from um Assyrian art from the palaces, um, the, the art in the palaces of the Assyrian kingdom like from 6,000 years ago. And it's all these like stone um, carvings that if you really look at it, it's just, it's so, it's just sex. It's just basically gay sex. If you really spend your time, if you really get up with a magnifying glass, you see it's just Babylonian boys playing with each other's butts. And it's just, it's <laughs> just, I mean, it's dirty. And I kept like screaming, like, oh my God, come look at this up to my sister. And then there was this one that was like, it was like a an eight inch cylinder rod that had like a woman's face carved in it. And it said, this is a vessel for oils. And I was like, this ain't no vessel for oils. This is a damn dildo if I have ever seen a dildo in my life. And when you read like the placards, it's always like, you know, scenes from the palace, but it's like, you know, like an orgy of gay sex. And <laughs> you know that like the, the the people in the museum are just having a blast because they can't really write this, that what, what, what you're really seeing. So anyway, so I was having, you know, I was doing that and I was running around and taking pictures of all the butt sex and the, the cone stone carvings. And my I sister, guess we'll post some of those on the WOW report. <laughs> right. <laughs> my sister went over to the door and it's a very quiet museum, mind you. Okay. And my sister went over to the door and lifted up her mask a little tiny bit and took a sip of water. Well, the minute she did, three docents came screaming out of nowhere saying, Oh my God, you can't do that. You can't do that. What are you doing? What are you doing? And my sister started saying, well, well, no, the guard told me that I could go. I, if I went over to the door, I could do it. And slowly 
a crowd started forming around her and everyone lifted, took their phones out and started filming it because they thought she was carrying out. And I'm, and she's saying, no, 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 thank God. And the guards are screaming at her. And I'm saying, Cynthia, what are you doing? You can't do this. <laughs> and I'm a whore and trying to slink away and pretend I'm not with her as everyone's starting to film it. And I was really freaked out afterwards because I was like, this is like a very genteel museum. It's very like quiet and everything. And like all of a sudden, everyone just like reverted to, you know, like we're going to get the, like we're going to get a mob mentality of we're going to get this woman who dared to lift her mask to take a drink of water. And it just makes me think that things are tenser than what we know. And I just want to very quickly, another quick story. Um, I don't know. I go to the Ralph's right by you, Fenton, the third street in La Brea. Yeah. And lately, I've noticed that in the corners, there is, they have new guards. They're in full Kevlar vests, guns, mace, uh, uh, tasers, but an actual gun gun. And, you know, Seth, you know the neighborhood is, as well. It's, it's Hancock Park on one side, and it is um, uh, Orthodox Jewish on the other side. And those two groups get along very well together. I mean, it's everyone is very quiet and, you know, how are you? Oh, it's a lovely day. Oh, it's take, you know, stay hydrated. Everyone just, every, if you squabble, it's in homes, in public, everyone is very polite. And it, it, it makes no sense to me why, if, there, if there's been threats there or what's going on, but it is two guards in full tactical gear like they're in Kabul. I think it's because of those uh, people that have been going around places places in Southern California and just blatantly taking stuff and walking out the door with it. Or the, or the anti-maskers and the people, you know, maybe, but it's tense. Like you were saying, it, I just yeah. feel there's the tension everywhere lately and things are getting ready to explode again. Oh, it God. definitely feels like if there was a prequel to, to Mad Max, this is, we're living it now. And then like <laughs> next is Mad Max. It feels like like there are all these markers out there happening that like if, if we can connect the dots, we will see that we're leading towards an inevitable downfall. Great yeah. much, Jerry. James, you're just a repository <laughs> of evil, dark, depressing news. <laughs> Stock up on acid. <laughs> Oh, I thought you meant LSD for a moment. <laughs> Either. <laughs> or yeah. for a well, we're headed for Dune is what we're headed for. Right. <laughs> well, yes, the drought, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Number two. Number two. Bay and Jay do Tiffany's. Um, it's called About Love. It's a campaign. It's the first campaign that uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z have appeared in together. And they appear in this campaign He's got his hair done up like uh, well, Michelle Bachelet. Bachelet. Yeah. yeah, yes, she's wearing the Tiffany diamond that's only been worn by three women ever before. I think well, it's, it it's for it's, it's the, the original, and then Audrey Hepburn wore it to the um, uh, Audrey Hepburn, Lady yeah. Gaga, and Mary and Whitehouse. It, yeah, now in the UK, Mary Whitehouse was this censorious woman who went around censoring scripts and books and complaining about pornography. That this must be a different Mary Whitehouse, right. I think, that, yeah. I, who is yeah, Mary I Whitehouse? Know. Anyway, she, she's one of the four women who've worn this diamond that Beyonce is wearing. And Beyonce is the first black woman to wear the diamond. And, oh, it's the, so it's the, them two. And then there's this Jean-Michel Basquiat, Jean-Paul Basquiat. Jean, what the fuck Jean-Michel Basquiat Michel. painting Thank you. that nobody has ever seen before. It had been in private home. And it's sort of a Tiffany blue color, which is why Tiffany's has acquired it. Well, right. They're saying that he must have thought of Tiffany's when he was painting. There's no evidence for that. And I don't know if it's... Anyway, people seem to have their niggas in a twist about this campaign. James, what do you think? Well, first of all, I mean, it's, people are... are People are treating Beyonce in a way that they didn't treat Lady Gaga for wearing the diamond, which seems a little hypocritical, I think, is is what I'm getting off of, of Twitter. Um, it's the, the, the diamond itself was mined in 1854 or something like that in South Africa. And 1877. it is 1877. Correct. And it's, it is a blood diamond. I mean, we just we can't get around the fact that it should the diamond itself should go back to the people of South Africa which is sort of where people are going with this. But 
it's not it's not Beyonce's fault for wearing it. I mean, you know, I mean, like she was just she's wearing the, and people were acting like Beyonce should take the diamond, snatch the diamond and walk over and give it to the, you know, a museum docent in South Africa herself. But that's not the case. And also my my problem with the is that in the, in the course of doing this podcast, we've talked a lot about Jean-Michel and how he had a tendency to um, bring rich women into the, the downtown scene who he thought people, you know, he was always trying to, to make a sale. And so he was, he would hang out with rich people, but he, I think he sort of disliked them. I think he sort of, he just saw them as a, a means to an end. And I don't know that Jean-Michel would want to be associated with Tiffany's in this way. Well, it's a bit late. I mean, his stuff is all over hair maze bags and I, you can't get away from his stuff. I actually interviewed Julian Schnabel, who did uh, uh, the, the, the Basquiat film, and I asked him what, like, what well, this was before this whole controversy. I just thought, I can't get away from his imagery, and what do you think he would think of all this? And uh, if I recall, he said he'd be fine with it. You know, he had no problem, uh, uh, you know, commercializing himself, and he wanted to be famous. So I, I find it weird that all of a sudden that, that this is a controversy and everyone's being so protective of his legacy, and where were they when all these other things were coming out? But I guess, you know, it's good for Tiffany's ultimately because when the movie, there's a little film of Beyonce singing Moon River to uh, Jay-Z that comes out September 15th and the print campaign launches September 2nd. And I'm sure all eyes will be on it and people will be rushing to Tiffany's. And I do love those little blue boxes. Robin's egg blue is it's a lovely color. Of course, if they're tying, hitching their post to um, Breakfast at Tiffany's, you know, that's a problematic movie in oh. that they're, they're, you have uh, Andy... Uh, uh, what's Mickey his name? Rooney, Mickey Rooney, Rooney uh, playing uh, this horrible Asian stereotype. So, it, you know, that could come back to haunt them as well. Well, of course, that's who Beyonce is referencing. She's referencing Audrey Hepburn. Right. And Breakfast at Tiffany's. The hair and the backless gown mm -hmm. and the black backless gown. Yeah. All right. Blake says we got to move America. on. We got to move on. Let's take a break. We'll be right back after the break with the number one thing this week that made us go wow. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back. Uh, the number one thing this week that made us go wow. What is it? What is it? It is. Oh, this is the best story ever. I'll just read from Deadline Hollywood. The um, let me see, let me see. Let well, me see. Wait, hold on one second. We do this and we apologize to Seth from who is from Hollywood Reporter. Well, we so are maybe the Hollywood here. Reporter reported. Uh, I'm sure they did. It's the same company now, Penske. It is. Okay, okay, go uh, ahead. sister publication. Number one, <laughs> the now 30 year old man pictured as a baby on the cover of the multi million selling Nirvana album Nevermind filed suit today in Los Angeles, alleging the former members of the grunge rock trio, various record companies, art directors and others, 17 people all in all, violated federal criminal child pornography laws and caused him lifelong suffering, trafficking his image worldwide. What the, I, like, come on. Well, especially because think? this guy for the last 20 years has been absolutely fine with it and, and his pose re you know, re reenacted it and is it, you know, conventions and, and talking to fans and reenacted it. Not once James four times on the 10th <laughs> anniversary of the album, the 17th anniversary, the 20th and the 25th anniversary. It's like he showed keen every time. <laughs> he <showed> keen. <laughs> And he, that's the issue. He feels that his penis, you know, he said, um, let me see. He said that, uh, where is it? He went no, to it's, a it's the fact game. that the baby is reaching for money shows that it's sex. The baby is involved in sex work is I think how he was tr implying. And which is basically a QAnon. You know that some QAnon aunt or uncle has gotten to him and put in <laughs> whispering in his ear because he wasn't like this before. And now all of a sudden he just seems like a bizarre, you know. He said, James, when I go to a baseball game and think about it, man, everybody at this baseball game has probably seen my little baby penis. <laughs> I feel like That's I got true. part of my human rights revoked. <laughs> I mean, 
It Wait, really looks like can, nothing damn, like. You can look at my baby penis anytime you want. I'll I'll post them on the Wow Report. I'm not gonna. I, why would you get upset twenty years later? That's that the sounds like a doll. Life. My baby penis. <laughs> That's the put it to bed. I did do, take a bit of a dive. Here's an interesting bit in the in the lawsuit from the from the whatever you call it the document. He said that to ensure ensure the album cover would trigger a visceral sexual response from the viewer, the photographer activated Spencer's gag reflex before throwing him underwater. What? Wow. What has that got That's to do? With and like, why would you activate How the baby? Even know that in unless four I... months. Pay him. I... Give him money. Well, he He's wants. He, how much does he want? He wants a hundred million or something. Uh, one hundred and fifty thousand from seventeen different defendants. That's it. Oh. <laughs> That's it. Oh. Well, yeah. That's nothing. One hundred and fifty thousand from each of them. So oh. it's like, yeah, it's like. And so still million. only one point seven million or some, or no, almost two million. All the thing. happiness he's given us. Come on. <laughs> he also has a large tattoo on his chest that says "Never mind." See, yes. I'm telling you, he has had a he has had a Trumpian conversion at the hands of some relatives who have been saying, "Get yours, get yours." The same woman as the Monster Energy drink with the satanic symbols in it. You ever see that that oh, video? Yeah. <laughs> She's a genius. <laughs> 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 Seth, thank you so much for joining us. Please come again. It's so lovely to see you. Oh, so lovely to see you too. It is always fun. Thank you, James. We'll be seeing much, much more of you next week on James Appalooza. On and well then Earth. never again. <laughs> it's it's thank- my swan song. I am done. No. Forever. <laughs> okay, <Thanks> share. <laughs> Same time, same place next week. Until then, go out and do something that makes the world go wow. wow.